Um, well, for the benefit of the recording, I will give another formal introduction. Uh, welcome to the spring 2024 planning session for our law school chapters. My name is Emily Baranowski, and I'm Phi Alpha Delta's deputy director. Um, as I briefly mentioned before we started recording, um, I have been with Phi Alpha Delta for over 10 years, uh, primarily in chapter operations, uh, but we'll soon be turning a lot of that over to uh, Zena Strench, our new chapter operations coordinator, who will be working hand in hand with our director of operations and membership, Katie Gibbs. So I'll have their contact information at the end of this presentation. Um, but for those of you I know and have worked with for quite a while, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. I'm so you can still contact me for absolutely anything. And uh, for the most part, I'll probably still see all of you at events and things like that. So let's go ahead and uh, get into today's presentation. And I will move my head just a bit so that you can actually see what I have here on the slide. Um, here's what we think the chapter should really be considering as the spring semester begins. For a lot of you, you know, right now it's the end of January. So maybe you are moving back on campus this week or next week. Maybe you've already been on campus because you've been doing the July mini semester. Uh, maybe you're in a trimester system. So you're like, I actually didn't get a break and I've been here the whole time. <laughs> Either way, um, we want to make sure that everyone, regardless of their differences in school schedule and personal schedule, et cetera, are kind of considering some key things as the spring semester starts um, because things are going to get really busy. Um, so the first major thing to be thinking about is setting up and administering chapter elections and officer transitions. Um, I'm going to go over all of the deadlines, all of the things to be considering, how to set up elections, and then a full officer transition checklist for you all. Um, I will also point out as we're doing this now, I'm more than happy to send these slides out after the session. So if you want to take notes, great. Um, but you do have access to not only the recording of this that will be available, but the slides as well um, after the session and I'll make sure to share where to find additional resources uh, beyond what we discussed today. So going through elections and transitions, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about continuing recruitment and chapter programming in the spring. Um, elections and transitions are very important. I know they take a lot of time, uh, but it's important to continue chapter operations as much as possible. And we'll talk about how to do that effectively, how to do that without it taking a substantial amount of time from the current officers who are maybe looking ahead to graduation of the bar exam, things like that. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk a bit about Convention 2024 that's going to be taking place this summer. Um, so uh, for all of you, hopefully you have heard already that convention is happening this summer. If you are new to PAD, um, if you haven't seen some of our emails, we are going to be headed to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania this summer um, to uh, do our, oh goodness, it's in the 60s, Some a very <laughs> large number biennial convention. Um, so we are very much looking forward to that and we'll explain the best way to plan your attendance for that. Um, again, as we go along here, if you have any questions that you wanna throw in the chat, please feel free or go ahead and raise your Zoom hand. I should be able to see you if you do that. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with elections and transitions. So give me just one moment here. Um, okay. Well, misspoke. We're actually going to go ahead and start with the due dates and deadlines for 2024. And again, we are more than happy to share this with you after the session. You will get a copy of these slides. Um, and all of these are also posted on pad.org. Um, so they should be relatively easy for you all to find as you um, are planning for the year. So these are in order about what comes up first. And you'll notice some of these here are in purple. Some of these are in yellowish gold. Uh, had to throw in some pad colors in there. Anything purple is an operational deadline deadline, things to know about, anything in gold is specifically for the upcoming convention. Um, the, that event does have some deadlines associated with it that chapter should be considering. Um, so the first big one to know is February 15th, which is just about a month away. It seems very soon, very scary. <laughs> um, but that is our uh, posted deadline for our law school chapters to hold their elections. Now, there's two notes I always want to point out with this. One, this does not mean that the new officers need to take over over on February 15th. Um, this, there's a transition deadline that we'll talk about next. So just because you're holding them early doesn't mean you have to turn everything over right away. And two, we're fully aware that every school has different schedules. Your uh, school administration may have certain requirements for you. Um, if you do not hold your elections by February 15th, you are not going to get in trouble. However, we encourage you to be as close to that deadline as possible and definitely by the beginning of March, if, if at all possible, uh, because it's 
we found it is very critical that chap law chapters have a more time to do their officer transitions. There's more things going on. There's a lot more hoops to jump through with the school now. Waiting until end of March, early April to do this is going to be very, very difficult because a lot many, much less of your chapter will be engaged by that point. They'll be thinking about final exams. They'll be thinking about summer jobs, all that stuff. So do it early. That is our biggest piece of advice. Um, again, you uh, don't need to uh, complete your officer transition process, aka actually turning everything over to the new board until April 15th. So if you are doing this just based on our deadlines, you have a two month period uh, by which you can do this officer transition process. It's a great time for the incoming officers to shadow the old officers, uh, time to ask questions, set up meetings with uh, the executive office. Uh, if your district has a district justice, your district justice will host a meeting for all of the incoming officers so that they can be trained, they can get to know everybody. This is called the District Leadership and Transition Conference, so that hopefully you guys will be hearing more about those in the coming weeks. Um, so it's a pretty critical time period, but we try to give you as much time as possible because we know that you're doing a million other things in addition to just doing your file, the Delta stuff. Um, April 15th is also the date that fall calendars are due to the executive office. So during your officer transition, um, it's a good idea to set up a tentative fall semester calendar and turn that in. And then the other thing happening on April 15th is for the first time in many, many years, the file for Delta initiation fee, the fee for new members is going up. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, then we're moving into some deadlines that are just about convention. Uh, on April 18th, we have convention grant applications being due. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit during our convention session, but any individual member may apply for a convention grant. We want to try to make it as financially simple for you all to attend convention, though, so those are not due until April. And then by May 3rd, the chapter should know uh, what who is attending convention on behalf of their chapter and be reporting that to us. And don't worry, you will get about 800 emails from us telling you the best way to do that. Um, but we will talk about that more when we get to the convention session, section. Uh, the first Monday in June is when award applications are due. You don't have to wait until June to submit them, but we do encourage uh, you to submit applications for chapter officers and programs from the 23-24 school year. Uh, Looking ahead to some more convention uh, deadlines, the convention registration fee will increase in July, so important to get your registration in before then. Um, and then convention itself is held July 31st through August 3rd. Um, I believe the 31st is a Wednesday. People do not need to be in town on Wednesday. We will not get started until the afternoon of Thursday, August 1st. So I believe my head is currently blocking the little note that says that. I'll move out of the way there. So as you're planning, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I got a direct message. What does a grant cover for convention? That's a great question. Um, it depends on the grant itself. We have quite a few available. For the most part, 99% of our grants are valued at $500. That can be going toward at the recipient's discretion. That can cover registration fees. It can be issued as travel reimbursement. So that is kind of up to the individual um, recipient. And a lot of our grant recipients also end up using those grants in addition to the chapter stipends that we offer. Um, so there's a lot of funding available. Um, just to throw that out there now, since I already mentioned it, each chapter has a $375 stipend to work with, which can also go, to, go toward the registration fee um, and toward uh, travel reimbursement, and that you don't have to apply for that. You just get it automatically, and the chapter officers just have to tell me who, who it's going to. So um, registration fees and travel reimbursement, those are the big things for stipends and for grants, and we'll definitely talk more about that later. Great question. Um, and then the final deadline on this list is something that some of you might not even have to worry about if you are graduating this year, but if you are potentially running for office, you're going to be around for the next school year. Um, I always like to throw in November 8th. Not only is it File Fidelity's founder, Founders Day, but it is also when the spring calendars are due to the executive office. So just like um, how we ask you to turn in your fall calendars in advance, we ask for the spring ones too. Um, I want to talk very quickly about fees. Um, all of you who are here are current members. So I do want to just make sure you know that the initiation fee increase affects absolutely none of you. You're already in. We've got you. <laughs> um, but um, for the new members coming in, starting April 15th, we are raising the uh, fees by $10. Um, again, we don't 
necessarily want to do this, but as a result of inflation and honestly, primarily rising insurance costs, we are raising our fees to cover that. Um, it is still going to be a one-time fee. It is still going to be uh, eligible for payment plans if anyone wants that. Um, and again, if anyone submits an application before April 15th, they are locked in at the low rate. So that might actually be a really good resource for you all as you're doing spring recruitment. If anyone's on the fence about like, oh, maybe I'll join now, but maybe I'll wait until the fall, tell them to join now because they will save $10. And I know that in law school, even $10 can make a difference. I feel like that's the price of like one fancy Starbucks coffee these days because uh, it feels like everything is more expensive, but hey, we'll take what we can get. Um, so just keep that in mind. Again, it does not impact any current members or anyone who signs up to join before April 15th. It only affects people joining April 15th and later. Um, so please go ahead and just make a note of that. Um, and it is impacting all of our fees. It's not just the law student uh, fee. It's also the pre-law membership fee, and it is the alumni fee as well. Um, there are some key resources that I always want to draw your attention to um, when we are having these conversations. We're going to talk a little bit about resources at the end as well, um, but always just to point out, as you are starting this process of planning elections and officer transitions, as you're looking into just, you know, passing things over to a whole new set of leaders for your chapter, um, keep in mind that we have a new officer resource guide. We have chapter operations guide. We have chapter materials that we send to you for free, and we now offer virtual chapter meetings that can be scheduled at any time that we are open. Um, so all of the links to that are here. Um, and again, that law officer resources page, I think I've said this a million times on other meetings, so I'll, I always feel like I'm saying it too much. But if you're only going to share one resource with an incoming group of officers, make it that page because it has everything that they will need. Um, and we highly encourage uh, incoming officers to bookmark that. So there are lots of things that can help you as we get into this next step, which is planning for elections. And I will go ahead and move myself so you can actually read this. Great. So I think the best thing to start with is to talk about setting up an election first, because some of you may have done this before, um, or some of you may have only just been on the other side uh, when you were actually running for the position. So you know, might know what it looks like from a participant standpoint, but not necessarily as an administering officer. Um, the key thing first is to create a plan. Uh, we encourage the entire outgoing board to, to work on this together. If you have a faculty advisor that you want to involve them, that is a great idea. If you don't know how to set up the election plan, get in touch with us. We are more than happy to walk through walk through it with you. This would include the dates, um, when you want people to let you know that they are running by, you know, when you want nominations due, um, a date of maybe when you want to have a chapter meeting so that the chapter can meet the candidates. And then finally, what date are you actually holding the election and what date will you be having them take over their new positions? Again, since the deadlines between having the election and the officer transition are so far apart, um, you don't have to do them back to back like that. Um, the election plan should also include structure, and by that we mean what format are your elections taking? Will they be virtual? Will they be in person? Are you following a very traditional Roberts Rules style of election or much more informal? We'll talk about that a little bit, especially as we get to the virtual versus in-person elections bullet. Um, so once you have a plan, the next thing is you need to tell your chapter members that. Make sure they know what the open positions are. There are five main positions in PAD, justice, vice justice, clerk, treasurer, and marshal. However, your chapter might have more positions than that. You might elect your committee chairs instead of having them appointed. Uh, you might be required by the school to have a position such as a recruitment chair or parliamentarian. That's okay. So make sure that everyone in the chapter knows what the positions are, when things are going to happen, and how they should expect to be involved, whether they're running for office or just voting in the election. Uh, next, based on the dates and structure you set up, it is important to collect nominations and candidacy statements. Candidacy statements are not required, but I personally love them. I think it's a really smart way um, to give everyone an even playing field by saying what they want to accomplish in their role if they're elected, um, and a way to share this with the chapter. Um, we all know that everyone wants to everything virtually these, these days. So if you can publish a virtual candidacy statement so that someone who even cannot attend an in-person meeting can understand what they're voting for, that is very key. We are, I'm very big on transparency and ease of information. So candidacy statements are a huge plus. When you're publishing all of that information to the membership, make sure you know, uh, make sure that you are sharing 
who is running for what, and again, what their platform is. Um, beyond that, you know, we do allow chapters um, and, uh, excuse me, not chapters, candidates to uh, campaign if they wish, uh, but, you know, keep it, keep it pretty, uh, low key, you know, we're not, we're not changing the world here. Um, that's what you're going to do after you graduate. Um, this is by Alpha Delta, you know, we're running for a few positions here. So keep it clean, keep it fraternal, keep it professional. Those are the big things with campaigning. Next, you'll conduct your voting process and how chapters do this. It varies widely based on school to school, chapter to chapter. Um, so if you have questions on how to do this, we are more than happy to help you. Um, sometimes if you do it virtually or electronically, you're using something as simple as Google Forms or um, a chapter twin page that's set up by your school. If you're doing it in person, you might be doing a literal written ballot. You have it all written out. Oh, can't even see my notes here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you write it all out, you check it, and then the marshal counts them all up and uh, announces the winner. However you want to do that is up to you, and we are happy to help you come up with a system that makes the most sense. The next thing that you will want to do is report the results to your chapter members, to your school, and to the executive office. Um, we have a very handy reporting form that was linked on a previous page um, that will allow you to just put everyone's information there in there. You are also welcome to email me, Zena, or Katie, or all three of us to give us all of that information. But the key thing is that we need to know is who was elected, what is their email address, aka how can we get in touch with them, what position are they serving, um, and ideally we'd love their phone number as well so that in case we need to get in touch with them uh, about any urgent issues, we know how to do so. The last step is to then transition the new officers into the role, and we will go ahead and definitely talk about that in our next slide. Um, but before we do, we want to talk about election structure a little bit, because I think the biggest question that I have gotten in the last few years, um, especially since COVID, is what to do about in-person versus virtual elections. Um, there's no wrong answer to this. It's okay to do virtual. It's okay to do in-person. It is okay to do a combination of both. Um, personally, I do love um, an online voting system that allows everyone in the chapter to participate, regardless of whether or not that they can actually be there physically in a room at a set time. Um, but there is also something very, I think, meaningful about an in-person election, being able to see the results immediately, being able to congratulate and welcome those new officers right away. So it really is all about the culture in your chapter, what your members want. And if you're really not sure, you can always poll your members really quickly. That can absolutely be virtual just to say, what would you prefer? Do, are you tired of going to meetings and you just want to do this all online? Or do you really want this to be a, a big momentous occasion where we all get together and we all vote? There's pros and cons to both. I think the pro to doing it in person, again, it's meaningful. You have a chance to congratulate people right away. It's faster because you are literally in that room. Um, but a con can be that, you know, if someone's sick and can't make it, then they they can't vote and that's unfortunate. Um, and then for virtual, I think a, a pro is, again, you're, you're getting more people involved. You are um, in a position where you can easily send out information. Um, usually if you do it electronically too, a computer counts for you. Um, I know we all say we didn't go to law school to have to do math. So, you know, we, we love that, that the computer will count for us. Um, but it does take a little bit longer because you can't just say, hey, everyone raise your hand or submit this piece of paper. You have to give everyone enough time to actually properly vote. And that's usually about 48 hours. So that's just something to consider there. Um, I want to touch a little bit on common election issues that we see as well. This may be something you're already considering um, if you are setting up elections now. I would say the biggest issue that we have seen in recent years is that uh, members are kind of disengaged from the process. They either aren't showing up to vote or they aren't showing up to be candidates in the first place. Um, and if that's the case, uh, things, the steps of what to do are going to vary greatly chapter to chapter. Um, so it's going to depend on, okay, let's have a conversation about your campus culture. Let's have a conversation about what your chapter has been doing this year. Let's have a conversation about how you're advertising the elections, because I think nine times out of 10, everyone's just so busy. They may, maybe if you only sent one email and someone missed it, that can explain so many issues. So uh, make sure that you are emailing you are putting things on your chapter social media if you have them. You are announcing that during other events and chapter meetings. It is very important to make sure that your members are aware of this. That's coming up, and that is the first solution to combating that disengagement that we've been seeing. 
Um, if you are in a position where you are a very small chapter, maybe you're revitalizing, you're, you're kind of still rebuilding, um, keep in mind it's okay if you are not going to be filling all of the positions. Um, you know, we say that one position is not more important than the others, but if you're going to focus on positions to fill first, my suggestion would be justice, treasurer, and clerk. And the reason for that being is justice is the first role, the first line of defense, um, the uh, the main uh, you know leader of the chapter. You want to make sure you have that role filled. Treasurer is very important because if you, especially if your chapter is a bank account, you need someone to give the money to. You don't want to lose that. So that's very key. And then clerk is also very important because they are the chapter record keeper. So it's very important to have someone in that role as well. So um, I'm not saying that vice justice and marshal are not equally important. They absolutely are. They are just as much a part of the team. But if we are getting down to a point of prioritization of roles, that's what I would suggest that you start with. Um, if you are in a position where um, your members aren't showing up to vote at all, again, I would very much look at your communication style. How are you letting your chapter, your members know about this? And are you giving them enough notice? In this day and age, I don't believe one or two days is a substantial enough amount of notice to ask someone to do something. I would say a week at minimum, and that's also going to require a reminder. Um, I read a statistic lately that said that the average adult attention span has dropped substantially. It was in the 20 minutes area. Now it's down to 17 minutes minutes um, and it's even getting even lower. So if we keep that in mind that our attention spans as American adults is decreasing, um, make sure that you are communicating efficiently what you need your members to know when they need to do it by and you're sending them follow-ups. So that's key to know there. Um, is anyone here on the call who's having election issues that they want to talk about now um, or things that they're maybe worried about as we're getting ready for the election time? Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, so once you've actually held your election, again, um, next big thing that you're gonna wanna do re besides reporting your election is conducting this officer transition process. Um, this checklist, again, I will send it out and it is also available in the new officer resource guide and I believe in the chapter operations guide as well. So you don't have to memorize it, um, but I will walk through a couple of the items on here. Um, it's important to know that there's no really wrong way to do this as long as you're effectively communicating the information. So whether this is a big meeting where all the outcoming and incoming officers get together and do this all at once, great. If it's one-on-one -on -one meetings, outgoing justice, incoming justice, they meet, they talk about their stuff and that's that, then that's okay too. My personal recommendation, if you are asking for it, is to do um, a short big meeting with everyone together so that everyone feels comfortable, they feel uh, familiar with who is taking everything on. A lot of the nitty gritty can then be done individually, and then the new board should follow that up with a meeting of just them where they can talk about the things they learned, talk about things they have questions about, um, and really set a plan for the year. It doesn't have to all happen in the same day, it can happen over the course of several days, um, a week, a month, whatever works for everybody's schedule. But I think it's important to start together, break out, and then come back together. Um, I find that to be incredibly effective in communicating the information. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I have it noted on here. Um, it's very critical that any accounts that require signatures like bank accounts and all physical chapter materials are transferred to the new officers as soon as possible. I would actually make that the number one priority um, over absolutely everything because those are the things that cannot be replaced if they go by the wayside. Um, so by that, I mean, you know, if, if you lose access to your bank account, even I can't assist with that, unfortunately. So it's something that you're going to want to take care of right away, um, especially if it ends up being a process where you have to go and sign in person or something of that nature. Um, and then anything that you have that's like a chapter banner, a gavel, recruitment materials, things like that that you don't want to replace or that might be expensive to replace, you're going to want to get those turned over right away as well so that the new officers have those. Um, a lot of the other materials we can provide replacements for if it is recruitment materials, if it's initiation materials, things of that nature. Um, but definitely get the, that big stuff turned over soon. No one wants to have to start the school year without a chapter banner if they don't, if they uh, had one the last year or anything like that. 
Um, the in the outgoing officers should be making sure that um, the new officers have the resources they need to effectively plan for the new year. And that's going to include connecting the new officers with school contacts, whether that's someone in the student affairs office who is required to have all of this information, or maybe someone that, you know, that's in the career services center who's been a huge supporter of the chapter, um, who you want to make sure they continue the relationship with, that kind of thing. Um, connect them with us at the executive office, make sure that we know them, even if it's a quick introductory email just to say, hey, this person's in charge now. Great. We would love to meet them. We want to make sure that that transition is as seamless as possible. You want to make sure that you discuss the duties of each, each officer position, which yes, we have listed out in our guides, but also varies from chapter to chapter. Um, so you want to say, hey, you know, I know this wasn't in the guide, but specifically for our chapter, you need to be the one that's visiting Mr. So-and-so and filling out the room request form, because that is something that has to happen for us to have any meetings. Great. Go over all of that. Um, and if you're an outgoing officer, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. Think about what you wish you knew when you were starting this role, um, because that isn't going to be just a very easy place to begin. Have them shadow you as you go through maybe the process of working with the school administration, submitting a budget request, planning a chapter meeting. That's going to be critical. Um, once you've gotten that part done, that, that section that's all like discussing the duties, transferring things, that's the essentials. Then you move into planning for the new year. And that's when the outgoing board starts to kind of step back a little bit and let the incoming board take over. Um, talk about what activities and programs the chapter put on in the last year? Did they go well? Did they go really badly? Were there lessons that were learned that you want to pass on? Um, let the incoming officers sit down and compile the fall programming calendar. Maybe they want to use some things that took place last fall. Maybe they don't want to totally reinvent the wheel, but they're like, well, but we'd love to throw in an extra community service event or something of that nature. Um, really just take the time and be honest with them about what went well and what didn't from the past year. That's a great learning opportunity um, because you want to make sure that they have as much information as possible to maintain the chapter's growth. And then have them sit down and create, establish future goals, fundraising for convention, attending mock trial, anything like that, just to say, hey, what's something we want to accomplish this year? Keep them realistic, keep them simple, um, but it's always important to have kind of an overarching vision or mission statement of what you want the chapter to accomplish in the next year. So, so while all that is going on, while you're having elections, while you're doing officer transitions, uh, it is also still important that you're continuing chapter recruitment and programming. We do know these tend to take a little bit of a dive in the spring because one, final exams are insane and that's where you want your focus to be. Two, because elections and transitions take a long time. Um, and three, just because of the nature of student organizations as a whole, there's usually not as much going on in the spring. However, in our opinion, that does not mean it should stop. Um, you are more likely to have engaged, consistent members if you are having in consistent events and programs. Um, you are more likely to ensure the long-term success of your chapter if you are continuing recruitment and new programs. Um, it's setting the tone that Phi Alpha Delta is open 24-7, 365, that it's something that people can join at any time. Um, so please don't forget about these uh, this spring recruitment. One of the things I always say is try to get the three L's before they graduate. We have a ton of bar prep discounts that they're going to want to take advantage of. And again, you know, after April 15th, and even as they join in as an alum, you know, that those rates go up. Maybe they want to join so that they can get, I think it's $100 off of Kaplan right now is something that we offer. Uh, Themis gives out free courses from time to time. Maybe that's something that they want. So Make sure that you are getting those three L's and saying, hey, we have something that can help you now um, if you want to participate in it. And even if they say, well, I'm about to graduate, why would I join a, st join a student organization? Um, it's because we are with you for life. <laughs> so it's not just a student organization, it's a lifetime membership. And there's a lot of things that we do just for alumni that they can take advantage of. Follow up with people from the fall. If there's anyone who uh, didn't you know, actually get any uh, recruitment materials that they said they were interested, but they never actually paid anything like that. Follow up with them. This is a great time to do that. Make sure that you do that and keep um, the 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 other members, especially the ones who joined in the fall, engaged in this process. Tell them to go out and invite a friend to join. You don't have to do these elaborate recruitment programs when you can kind of do a um, 
<clears throat> a targeted, you know, hey, let's just do an invite a friend day. We do that occasionally on a national level too. We just did one for our founders week that worked out pretty well. So uh, for all of that, just keep in mind, you don't have to do anything crazy. It's just about maintaining consistency. Um, that's key for spring programming as well. I highly suggest that you focus on events that will help members prepare for the summer, uh, whether that's internship preparation, the bar exam for graduating members, uh, picking classes for the fall. Um, I know especially for, you know, 1Ls going into 2L year, that's going to be a big stressor for them and you want to help them as much as possible. Um, and we highly suggest that uh, you make sure to include fundraising as a big part, especially this semester, because we are preparing for convention coming up. So again, these are just some ideas, some resources for you, and I'll make sure to send these out. So I won't go through them bullet by bullet, um, but we'll we'll move on to our next section here. Uh, however, before we do, if anyone has any recruitment or programming questions, please go ahead, feel free to raise your hand, and we'll take a look at them. No? Okay. Great. Okay. On to convention. Um, if I can get a show of hands, it can be the Zoom hand, it can be your physical hand. Um, how many of you had actually heard of convention before I started talking about it roughly 30 minutes ago? <laughs> okay, I see Blaze. I think I saw Corey's hand. Okay. All right, that's good. All right, that that's actually considering there's only a few of us here. That's a pretty good group. <laughs> um, okay, that's great. Um, for those of you who don't know, maybe you're new to PAD, uh, maybe you're, you know, just new to being an officer, what have you. Convention is held every two years, which is, it might be, you're like, wait, why didn't I hear about this last year? Because we didn't do it last year. So there you go. Every two years, we have a convention for our law students and our alumni members. We gather in different parts of the country. Um, it is a mixture of um, fraternity business. We do our national elections at that event. Uh, it is um, networking events. We try to set up a lot of social events. We're going to do even more this year to give you all a chance to get to know each other, to build those connections with your fellow students and with practicing attorneys. Um, it is also workshops for our law students. We usually focus on bar prep. We usually focus on chapter operations, things of that nature, stuff that's actually going to help you once you get back to school. Um, and then we try to have fun as well. <laughs> we really do. Um, it's, it's a fantastic event. Um, 99% of our attendees say they go just for the people. Honestly, that's the biggest amount of feedback we get from our post-event surveys every year. So I think it's kind of hard for me to just sit here and tell you it's a great event to go to for the people without you actually knowing any of those people. But I promise you that people have gotten jobs. They have met partners. <laughs> there have been families created from this convention. Um, one of the unique things about Phi Alpha Delta is that kind of gray area that we live in between professionalism and fun. And I think convention is a perfect example example of that. Um, so we'll be heading to the Omni William Penn Hotel in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It is right in downtown Pittsburgh. It is a fantastic location. It is a historic property. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, ironically, or not ironically, I guess, but we, we didn't realize this when we signed the contract, but it's actually not the first time we've been there. Our 1958 convention was actually held in the same hotel, uh, which is really fun. Uh, clearly they, the, the brothers in 1958 thought it was a good idea. So we're going to, we're going to keep going with that. Um, uh, but there's a lot of things to do. We are very close to the sports stadiums. Um, personally, again, I'm, you know, the executive office is based in Maryland. I'm from Baltimore, so I don't think it's worth going to Steelers Stadium or the whatever they call it these days, but that's your business if that's something that you like. Um, but we, uh, even though the Steelers won't be playing that time, I don't think we'll be in preseason yet. Um, but I know that the Pittsburgh Pirates are expected to play. I believe there's a game scheduled for that weekend. If you're a baseball fan, we're going to see what we can do about getting everybody over there. Um, it's really a really fantastic location um, for anyone who went to our 2022 convention. You know, that was a, a different feel. We're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. You couldn't walk to anything. Trust me, this is the exact opposite. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we always list August as the dates. Again, technically, uh, July 31st, that Wednesday, a lot of our key volunteers will be arriving. Uh, but if you are attending, if one of your chapter members is attending and you're like, wow, Wednesday to Sunday, that seems like a lot. If you want to do Thursday to Sunday, that's OK, too. Um, we are also happy to, um, in, you know, whatever you can join us for, we are happy to have you. Usually the major business sessions take place on Friday and Saturday. Uh, we wrap up on Saturday night with our awards banquet and everyone heads home on Sunday unless you were elected to the board, in which case you stick around to have a meeting, <laughs> but everyone else usually heads home from there. 
Um, I can confirm having flown there myself that the Pittsburgh airport is, um, it has quite a few airlines. It's really easy to get in and out of. Um, so we're really excited to be in Pittsburgh. Um, and for a lot of our East coasters, it's actually a pretty decent drive as well. It's not, it's not too bad. Um, I think our staff are gonna be driving out there so we can pack as much of the stuff as possible going out. Um, we already kind of briefly mentioned this. I went over, you know, what the convention grants cover, but financial planning is always a huge consideration. Um, I have had people point blank ask me, you're telling me I have to go to this. How am I going to pay for this? And that's a very fair question. So there's a few things that we offer to assist. One, chapter stipends. I mentioned them earlier, um, $375 per chapter. So um, that is something that you don't have to apply for. That is just there available for you to use. The chapter officers should just tell me who is receiving it, whether that is in the form of going toward the registration fee or whether that is travel reimbursement after the event. Um, whatever it is, we will make it work. Two, the grants. Again, we went over that a little bit as well. Grants are individual. They are not for the chapter. So if you apply, you are applying as an individual. But we have quite a few available for um, both our current student members, um, for any special interest groups. Um, for example, we have one specifically um, for Black students, if that is something that you identify as. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. I believe Native American students as well. All of these were set up by alumni. Um, so they all found something that they were passionate about, something they wanted to contribute to. And they said, hey, we want to make sure that certain groups of people make sure that they make it to convention. Um, there's also grants specifically for certain districts and chapters. Um, I believe District 7, which is like Missouri uh, area, um, uh, Kansas, et cetera, they have quite a few grants available to them. So if you're not sure, if you wanna find out if there's something specifically for you or for your chapter or for your area, just send me an email. I am more than happy to walk through the convention grants with you. Um, but I will go ahead and just throw a quick link in the chat um, to get, show you all of our grants and scholarships. So there you go. If you wanna take a look at that, that is all of our convention grants, all of our chapter and member funds. And you will see that convention section is very, very beefy. So that's, that's great. That's a lot of things. Um, and if you are graduating this spring, don't worry, we have not forgotten about you. There are grants for what we call our young alumni, our recent alumni. If you're less than five years out from graduating, there are grants to assist you as well. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> The other um, step, I know uh, some people talk about financial planning sometimes in terms of like a three-legged stool. Um, personally, I'm of the opinion that, you know, financial planning, much like stools, can be as sturdy as possible. So it doesn't need to actually just be these three of stipends, grants, and fundraising. You could be doing a lot. Um, fundraising, I think, is super key. Your chapter should be doing that all the time anyway to support itself. But um, if the chapter can even raise $200 to help a delegate get to convention, that could be a really big deal for them. Um, I also also think that you need to start getting really pushy with your administration about helping you get to this event. Um, not just with student affairs or your SBA, whoever it is that gives out your standard um, student organization funding, but go directly to your dean, go to your career services office. Sometimes they have special funding set aside for these professional development or networking events. If you can prove it will bring value back to the school, there's an extra pool of funds that are available to them. Um, I know these days um, I, I talk to administrations fairly regularly and they like to stonewall you a lot when it comes to money because they're saying, oh, we're still recovering from the pandemic, blah, 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 all this other stuff. And I like to ask, well, then where did all the student organization fees that you have still been collecting even when we weren't on campus, where did they go? Um, so that's always a fun conversation to have. But all of you as uh, future lawyers, I am confident can argue your way in and out of everything. Um, but if you need any talking points um, or information about what is going to happen at convention, we are more than happy to help you with those conversations conversations. Um, so again, as you're starting to plan for the spring, my biggest piece of advice is to set some fundraising programs because no, nothing is too small. Again, a couple $50, $200, $1,000, whatever it is, is going to help that delegate. And if they can stack that on top of grants, if they can stack that, stack that on top of chapter stipends, that is a huge deal. Um, I think one of the things that we sometimes forget when it comes to fundraising as, as well is the direct ask of alumni. If you want help crafting a message to alumni to solicit donations, I am more than happy to assist you for that. Um, we, are, we can definitely, definitely do that. I got a direct message in the chat. Are donations tax deductible for this? That is a great question. 
Donations made to chapters are not tax deductible because Phi Alpha Delta and its chapters are 501c7 nonprofits. Um, it's a special classification from the IRS. However, if someone were to donate to our foundation, they are the ones that run the grants and scholarships, that is tax deductible because the foundation is a 501c3 organization. They are separate entities. Um, so unless you're really into tax law or nonprofit law, that might be, you're like, okay, I didn't need to know all of that, but um, people can make donations to the foundation on behalf of either a member or a chapter if they want to, just get in touch with me um, because then we can make sure that they get the most bang for their buck with the tax deductible stuff. Uh, but if they are direct donating directly to a member or a chapter, no, that is not tax deductible. So. Um, the other big thing to know about convention um, is the delegate selection in the fraternity business. Um, that is kind of a big thing that we uh, work on um, at convention, the election of the new board. Um, if there are any things up for debate on the convention floor, sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. One of the joys of being a fraternity of lawyers is that sometimes they are very smooth debates and sometimes they get a little contentious. And I hate to say it because I don't understand this as an event planner, uh, but I think sometimes the contentious ones make everyone have more fun. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but it is a really, really, Really exciting opportunity to be part of um, conversations about where the fraternity is going, what we are working on as a whole, uh, for you to connect with people who are going to be the next leaders of the fraternity and share what you think the priorities are. Um, so that's why it's really critical to select someone who's going to go in and take it seriously. Um, we we do have, um, I believe it is two chap two delegates per chapter get voting rights. However, you can send as many people as you want. Um, I know I was talking to Mason chapter the other day and they are gunning for 10 people going to convention. They're going to rent a giant van and all drive together. You, by no means do you have to do that. Um, your chapter gets two votes. If you only send one person, that one person gets to vote twice. Um, and it's not until May until you need to let us know who is voting on behalf of your chapter. So you have plenty of time to figure that out. Traditionally, it has been a chapter officer, but that is not a requirement. It can be any member of your chapter in good standing. Um, does anyone have any question on that delegate selection process? No? Okay. Um, I could, this entire thing could have been about planning for convention. And to be honest, I think we are going to um, have a different virtual session later in the semester that will be about convention planning. Um, but if you, need to know why it's important. If you need to know how to get there, please get in touch with me. Uh, I'm more than happy to help your chapter uh, and more than happy to help individually. I have some discretionary funds to work with. I want to help you guys out. So please let me know um, if you have any questions at all about convention. It is very, very important. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a key thing to do. Uh, another question in the chat. If a school can't send on someone, is there a proxy option? Um, no, there is not a proxy option. Our governing documents do not currently allow proxy voting. Uh, so unfortunately, that is not something that is up to me. That is in our fraternity governing documents. So you do have to be present and accounted for to vote. Um, maybe that will change in the future. I don't know. Uh, but that decision is out of my hands. That would be at the decision of the internet national executive board. So great question though. Really great question. Awesome. Okay, we are coming up on almost an hour here. Um, so I want to spend the last few minutes focusing on this slide. Because as I said, I could do a whole session that's just about convention. I could do a whole session that's just about recruitment. And I have, and I probably will. <laughs> but this would be, I think, the number one slide I think I want you all to take away from this presentation is things the executive office can help you with. Um, because I think the biggest uh, thing that we are worried about here in our office with our full-time staff is that we are not effectively communicating all of the ways that we can help you. Um, and we want to make sure that you know how to do that. Um, so if you want to talk about things like getting your money's worth for your membership, especially with those initiation fees increasing, if you're coming to me, you're like, Emily, I can't ask someone to pay $90 now, let alone hundred. How am I supposed to talk to somebody about that? I am happy to sit down and we will do a itemized line by line list of all the things that you can get for that $90 going up to hundred and how your membership pays for itself. Let me know. We will do that together. 
Um, if you've heard me talk about fundraising for the last five minutes and you're like, that's great. I've never run a fundraising program. Why? I don't even know what to do. Great. We can help you with that. Um, if you're having trouble planning events, um, if you uh, are like, look, I really want to do this stuff, but I'm really burned out because I'm also in law school. Um, let us know. We'll connect you with our member benefit partners. They do free presentations. They do free resources. Some of them have sponsored chapters for things. We are happy to connect you with that. Um, if you want to learn about some of our specialty programs that we have, that would also take a whole uh, hour to discuss. Um, I know I, Blaze is here, the gold program, um, first one I see on the list, so forgive me if I'm missing anyone else who's on that. Um, uh, our speaker series, which is our virtual programming, which is roughly once every two months. Um, if you want to use that um, as a chapter programming, great, we can help you get connected with that as well. If you need chapter records, uh, local alumni, your chapter alumni, you're just your list of anyone who's in your chapter now. We Trust me, we have lists out the wazoo. Um, if you want to learn the best way to take advantage of those grants and scholarships that I've been talking about, I will talk your ear off about that too. And then I think some of these biggest issues, these last three bullets I have on here are probably the most common things that I get asked about these days. That's combating member disengagement. Um, that's effectively using social media and that's revitalizing your chapter after a period of inactivity. Trust me, we have resources for all of those. We're happy to discuss them with you. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, um, I am phasing out of chapter operations slowly, um, but uh, these people here are, are willing to help you. I am still here to help you. That does not mean that I am going anywhere. Um, it just means that I'm going to be focusing primarily on the event planning, um, our volunteers, and some of the other big ticket items <laughs> that require my attention here. Um, but if you need me for anything, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so please get in touch with any of us. Katie Gibbs is our tireless director of operations and membership. I'm sure some of you have talked to her before. She uh, does a, a large number of those um, individual chapter meetings. She's uh, probably the most enthusiastic person about PAD I've ever met who's not a Phi Alpha Delta member <laughs> because none of us staff are technically members since we're not lawyers. Um, but trust me, she is, if you need help getting your members engaged, she's the one to do it. Uh, Zena is new to us. She just started at the end of the year in December. So she's getting on her feet, um, but she's gonna be taking over a lot of uh, things like roster request, uh, recruitment materials, all of that stuff. So please don't uh, hesitate to reach out to any of us. Our office information is right there. We are open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yes, this is my nine to five. This is what I do every day is work with you all. Um, so this is definitely, we are more than happy to um, help you out with absolutely anything you need. And we just want to make sure that you know that. I'm going to go ahead and I will stop my share here um, and I will answer a couple questions. I know I got one question in the chat that asked um, for the initiation fee. Does the chapter keep any portion of the $90 or does it all go to the national office? Um, that all goes to our office. It is all based off of um, we need that money to operate. Um, but what it does go to primarily is insurance coverage. Um, every chapter and chapter officer is covered by insurance. Um, that's not extra. We cover that for you. Um, it is the day-to-day -day operation of some of the things that we do here. For example, we file your taxes for you. Um, all that fun stuff. It's a lot of stuff you guys don't even think about. Um, and then a lot of it also goes into the free materials that we provide. So even though we are charging for membership, we try to provide as much as possible free in return. So that includes recruitment materials, which come in virtual format and a mailed box format. Um, it includes initiation materials, so that new member certificates and pins, that's all included in the $90 as well. You don't pay extra for that. Um, it includes a lot of our virtual programming, um, our speaker series, um, some of our CLE credit, things like that, which I know you don't have to worry about CLE yet, but you will. Um, so just something to keep in mind, um, a lot of our programs. Um, and then in addition, we are always trying to expand on that. So it it's something that we uh, we are hope we can be doing a lot more often so that you can kind of do it as a, I don't know, a, um, an a la carte kind of system of like, hey, I need to check this speaker series on election and campaign finance law. Um, but I also want to learn, I know we just did one at the end of the year that was approved for CLE credit on Alaska Native corporations. That was really interesting. So we're always trying to offer that. Um, in addition, the uh, fee also does cover any of the discounts and the partnerships that we have. Um, we have a really uh, expansive member benefits page. So if anyone has questions on that, I'm more than happy to go into more detail. 
that was a great question. That's one of the most common questions we get is, <laughs> does it go back to the chapter? Oh, and some of that actually does go to the foundation. So some of it can go back to the chapter in the forms of grants, whether it's chapter grants or individual member grants. So it, it indirectly can go back. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? And um, I'll give it a minute and then I'll turn the recording off because if anyone wants to chat without being recorded, we can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> 